you don't hear me, you've got to raise your hand and let me know, okay? So uh, sitting next to me, um, Steve Hillard is one of the grads of this fine law school and has spent a career, much of which has been in telecom, working with uh, tribes, um, both Alaskan uh, Native and Alaskan Native corporations and other uh, tribes where issues around communications infrastructure was at the <coughs> forefront. He um, continues to be uh, engaged in this area and has thought a lot about these topics for a long time. John Jones has been at um, CenturyLink um, for quite some time and has also been a veteran of these issues, seeing it from sort of an established um, company perspective. Um, Andrew Moore is at the Boulder Valley School District and very involved in these issues throughout Colorado. And believe it or not, there's some remote areas within the Boulder Valley School District where broadband access is an issue. And finally, Patty Limerick, who brings an outside perspective, but one grounded in appreciating the role of infrastructure in um, the West, where we have lots of wide open spaces raising infrastructure challenges. So she won't necessarily speak to the weeds, but she will speak um, kind of from the air. <coughs> as it were. <laughs> she will. She will elevate the conversation in the goal. truest that's sense of the word. Um, so let me start on that first principles because uh, and I'm going to let Patty start from first principles here. When you talk about critical infrastructure and broadband, you often say areas without access to broadband and hold the thought, what is broadband for a minute? We'll get there. Those are in the weeds. But without access to broadband, risk being left behind. And so we have the concept of ghost towns, which were towns in the West where either the highways or the railroads didn't come from. So Patty, just starting on that first principle, share a little bit your thoughts on what it means to lack access to critical infrastructure, generally, then go into broadband in particular, and then I'll let others uh, join in that conversation. Oh my goodness, okay. I am not an expert in broadband, and that's been established, okay. Everybody okay with that? Okay, so, so I, I'm not scared anymore now that I've said that. Um, I think that the history of the American West is easily written in terms of remoteness and responses to remoteness and cost and benefit from remoteness. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that Indian people would certainly be well positioned to say is that when remoteness is breached and connectivity is in high gear, there's a risk in that as well. There's a risk of loss of identity, of cultural imperialism, of homogenization. So it's a, it's a tempered message that I would want to give on this, that to be uh, left behind, to have the railroad not come through your area, there's good news and bad news. No one in the room would attempt to sentimentalize 19th century railroads and to see them as agents of joy and progress and fairness and equality. Those are really not particularly uh, kind or generous institutions. So, so if we're thinking about railroads or telegraphs or whatever, it's really, there's advantages in terms of where you can be placed for economic gain. There's also very good chances that if, you're, if your infrastructure places you in a good situation for economic gain, there's risk that you will not participate in that economic gain because large corporations or, or uh, bigger operations will be drawn in. So. I can see the many ways in which we could talk about the rural West and reservations focusing on what those comparatively powerless, often comparatively powerless communities have lost by not having access to communication and transportation and being ruled by remoteness. But I can also see, well, two things, uh, some gains of, of distance from a powerful homogenizing culture and also some benefit risk of being romanticized because your peer, I mean, I'm thinking, is there a movement? I can't, I've never seen anything about it, but if we're in a cultural moment where there's much lamentation about what connectivity is doing to young people's brains and making them into different kinds of people, is there any counter effort to romanticize people who are in remote areas who are not under that, with children are not under that pressure of constant connectivity? Well, they're left out, they're losing some things, but maybe th their minds are more acute when it comes to social interaction or taking in their physical environment or um, remembering to treat other human beings as if they exist as material beings. So I'm trying to uh, do 
we're not popular, as historians are not popular because we're always trying to do this, oh, it's really complex and there's good news and bad news and it's all <laughs> intertwined, oh, it's very intertwined. Don't, so Siamese twins, you can't separate it. So, uh, so I hope that's an so, open no, that's, that's a good provocative start. Um, Steve, from the tribal perspective, I, I had not heard anyone suggest Patty's point before that there's an upside to staying mm -hmm. disconnected, if you will, from um, broadband. Uh, both picking up on Patty's point about the, you know, underappreciated upside as well as the more commonly articulated concern. Um, how do these issues of broadband access look from the tribal perspective? Well, first, Bill, let me say um, I approach this with a lot of humility because the first order of business, if you're talking about tribes, is really respect their uniqueness, their sovereignty, and their points of view and their desire to be um, closely involved. So there is no one paternalistic, one-stop shop approach that will be met with, um, with a lot of appreciation. And that's an echo, I think, of what you were just saying, which is there, uh, particularly just to stay on tribal areas in the more remote parts of the United States, mm -hmm. Alaska, parts of the West, um, I think a part of the equation really is, to, is involvement, respect, um, and coordination, and really participation by tribal entities in the solutions, and this could be whether it's medicine, uh, broadband, uh, transportation, um, um, you know, that's an, a key part of what the, in, the ingredients have to be. And you look at, at um, uh, while they, there obviously is aspiration to have, uh, be as connected as anywhere, um, the, the counter side of that that you always have to respect of trying to come up with a solution is respect for the sovereignty and uniqueness of the, of the people you're dealing with. So uh, the tribes that you know and work with, um, to what extent is this concern you know, a top drawer priority, or to what extent is this something that maybe is a second tier yeah, priority? I think most, at least in a lot of my history has been with Alaska Native corporations. And I've been a general counsel serving on a board of <laughs> 15 Native Americans for a number of years. And the, the, the priority number one, by and large, is uh, to bring up the level of education, income, and other factors for, for the, the, uh, the members of the Native Corporation or the tribe. Or the tribe. Um, so I think it's, in many ways, it's secondary, but if you don't respect it, then you're gonna, your program, your approach will run afoul. And, you know, it's really, in my experience, once you get used to that perspective and understand how to put consortiums together, how to bring coordination, um, then the other problems become much, much easier to deal with. And I think it's just to directly to your question. I think goal number one, certainly in many of the Native American communities that I've been working with, is, um, is advancement uh, for their children and their current, current uh, income and, and uh, culture. So let me jump to Andrew, um, who participates in a lot of consortium and discussions across the state of Colorado around this challenge. And just starting from, again, the first principle of why does it matter, what makes broadband access important, how do those discussions uh, usually go? Yeah, Phil, thanks. Um, you know, President Obama earlier this year, he, he had this quote, and it said, today's high-speed internet or broadband is not a luxury. It's a necessity, and from the educational standpoint, I think we heard earlier this morning that if you don't have that access, then learning um, becomes a challenge. We create the have and the have nots. When that happens, when we start to talk about those in the rural community, and the rural community to me is the plains, but it's also the mountains. It's places where we can't get that internet in there. Then you really create this environment where maybe the culture that we're talking about um, with the Native uh, Americans, then you can't even teach that in a way that is broad and, uh, and helps from that regard. Um, I see one of the biggest challenges out at getting broadband um, to the rural areas is competition and getting a, an environment where more than um, the government, where we do get our private sectors and private public partnerships engaged. And I, I'm sus I suspect we'll get to get into that a little bit, but we do have laws here in Colorado that prevent some public-private partnerships, Senate Bill 152 to be specific. And, and I think those things start to become barriers to, um, to going broader and wider with getting um, broadband out to the rural areas. 
All right, so before we get into that question, let me get back to the question I have deferred, which is how to define what constitutes broadband access. So for those new to this topic, let me give you a few numbers. Um, as recently as January 2009, the FCC defined broadband access as four megabits per, uh, um, megabits per second. Um, the FCC defines broadband access for access to universal service support, something we'll talk about in a minute as well, as 10 megabits per second. The FCC defines broadband access in general as 25 megabits per second. And different companies will offer different so-called speeds. Um, I say so-called speeds because, as Dale will explain, they're not actually speeds. They're bit rates. Um, this uh, could be at, at lots of different levels. So, Andrew, um, from your vantage point, how do you define what is true broadband? Well, I'll st first start by saying it's complicated. <laughs> so technologists and historians have something in common. Yeah, we yes. can have that. We're arm in arm <laughs> yeah. there. So. It's complicated because it's wrapped up in, um, in marketing as well. So some of you may have heard of one gigabit to the home. And wow, that sounds great, one gigabit to the home. Right now in Boulder Valley School District today, at this moment, I have four gigabit to 30,000 students. We're using a little over two gigabit at our peak times right now. So when you think about that, I personally don't need one gigabit to the home. That is way over provisioned today. And so um, I also have a hard time if we say it's 25 megabit to the home. Because if there is one student and two parents and the parents aren't streaming video, 25 megabit in the home is plenty for that one student. If you have 10 children at home and they're all trying to st stream, 25 megabit isn't enough either. And so I think you have to look case by case. Now having said all that, if you look back a decade ago, and you, if you would have asked, boy, do you need 10 megabit? You know, that was pre a streaming Netflix, pre Snapchat, pre uh, YouTube. We would say, oh my gosh, no, you'd never need 10 megabit. So I don't want to put an upward cap on it because the technologies that we have not yet invented yet are coming, and they may require gigabit to the home. Um, we just don't know if that's a decade down the road or um, a century down the road. So John, I want to give you both the why and the what question together. So the why question is, why does broadband matter? And then, of course, what what is sufficient broadband? Um, CenturyLink actually does offer one um, gigabit in um, many communities in Denver. And uh, in some remote, remote parts of Colorado um, may have plant that may not get to even 25 uh, megabits. So you see a, a range of usage. What, what are your takes on why is important and how much is enough? Well, the why, I think, is more uh, broadband now is table stakes, really, whether you're a city or we, I think the first panel did a great job covering the education and socioeconomic aspects of this, but let's talk a little bit more about just the economy in general. Uh, is that uh, I heard, we, we heard several uh, business leaders at a Kansas broadband forum recently say they, they would either move their business or were planning to move their business if they could not get fiber uh, uh, availability. They said fiber. Fiber. So they said the, they for a business, speak. this is a good distinction for people. Speak. Consumer, which is what we've been talking about, yeah. but then for business, Businesses, they need actual fiber and maybe one gig right. for their businesses. Right, so, but on the uh, consumer side, you know, I, I think you know, you're seeing more and more communities want the broadband, but I'll go back to the definition piece that if you've never had broadband before and we can get them somehow, some way, 1.5, that's broadband to them because that's better than nothing or, or the dial-up they have. But I'm not proposing that is the, the, the definition of it. But in most cases, we're finding that, that the, the needs uh, I'll touch back on the other earlier panel. When we taught our, uh, did our broadband uh, or, or digital literacy training, job applications were a huge part of that. They were pe most people wanted to know how to do an online job application, which makes a lot of sense. So that, that became a need there. But for the most part, we're, I'll go back now to the, to the definition of broadband. I think we were talking all around the fact that it's evolving as we speak. From the National Broadband Plan, which was four, to the time the CAF order came out, it was 10. And while the CAF order was being implemented, it went to 25. So it, it's very much a moving target. But I would also suggest that we really are facing two digital divides right now. The, the, the areas that we do not have broadband in today are really what I would consider the most high cost, least economic ones we have because we're at about 94% capability in all of our, or all our states combined. But we also have enabled about 16 cities with gigabit service. 
and kind of to your point, not everybody needs a gig, but as that speed threshold increases and it will continue to evolve, you're going to find haves and have nots with speed over time, depending on, on where you are. So I, I think we're also facing this, a speed digital divide at some point. So Patty, with a little more weeds on the table, digital divide, haves and have nots, this is not a broadband only conversation. Um, what's your perspective on how different communities end up differently situated and um, what both from an economic de development standpoint and maybe a moral one too, should public policy care about? I just, I have one helpful idea to start with, which is that I can see a huge problem with the word broadband because it should be broadband, broader band, broadest band, narrow band, narrower band. Narrow. So the term, it, it never occurred to me until this moment that there's something very misleading about that one word broad. Um, so I have, a, I'm not from the English department, but I am here to help you with, uh, with that <laughs> <laughs> wording. Okay. So, uh, access to infrastructure in Western American history is usually about power and who has it and who doesn't. And it helps to be a member of the big four in the Central Pacific Railroad. That gives you opportunities in, in life that you will not have as a Chinese immigrant worker on that railroad. So it's not very subtle in some ways that it's just who's taken power, who's been successful, this is a really important variable in Western history and infrastructure, who has successfully bribed a congressman. That's very important. Uh, when, people, when poor, poor President Obama occasionally says, oh, we must learn from the example of the Transcontinental Railroad, and we must apply that to our infrastructure problems, I think, no, <laughs> we have enough problems as it is, no, please don't tell young people to figure out how to bribe congressmen, that can't be the solution to our troubles. Uh, but, but the history is, a pretty naked exercise of power for who has access to infrastructure and who doesn't. And I would assume that continues. Or certainly the previous panel would uh, indicate that that continues. And yet there's also, I don't know if this is a term that we should do anything with because it's so difficult to gauge and calibrate, but luck is really a big factor here. And I don't know what I, I meant by that term. If I trying to help you with the term broadband. I, I can't quite help myself with the word luck, but man, uh, the providential accident of which route you happen, if you're a settler, which route do you happen to take, and does that become the place of, uh, and I'll say that Denver doesn't really make sense. Cherry Creek and South Platte, that's not, oh yeah, that's the uh, Monongahela and the Allegheny, that's really gonna make it a place. There's a lot of, of luck in natural resources, but also luck in the particular leaders. And I, I would might be drummed out of my kind of liberal leaning profession in some ways for saying this, but the quality of the entrepreneurs in an area that I don't think we're supposed to say anything nice in the humanities about entrepreneurs. You can but, talk about it in the law school though, we're good. Okay, here. good, well that, <laughs> feel much more comfortable with that. Uh, but, but the enterprisingness and the risk takingness and so on, although it's perfectly possible to take a big risk and, and be unlucky in that. So, but luck is a really big factor in there. And then I do think there's occasional very intentional resistance to being incorporated. My uh, old colleague Richard Maxwell Brown wrote a history of the attempt to kind of encapsulate Western American history by the trend of incorporation and who says yes and who says no to that. And so he has a very interesting thing which I won't trouble you with, but the OK Corral, places like that, you can see the yes, count us into the American economy, no, keep us out, that that's what they're shooting each other over at OK Corral, Dick Brown said. So there's some groups that just say, no, we don't care for that incorporation and we feel more independent and more able to exercise our will or maintain our cultures if we're left out. So. Okay, so naked power, very big, uh, luck, entrepreneurial spirit, and sometimes just that doesn't happen. To, I, I prefer individual choice over uh, being part of a prosperous system. That, that's, that's a factor that, again, can, can be particular to religious groups. There's a very fascinating history about religious cults and sects in the West who are trying to be isolated. I mean, the, the Mormons, the whole point was to be away and apart, and that darn gold rush screws that up, because then all those Gentiles keep appearing, and this is my family background. I'm not myself Mormon, but, it's, but I feel for them on that. So, okay, so, so 
<laughs> Maybe it's time to stop. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Steve, I think there's some interesting connections to what Patty said. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> the issues faced by some tribes, some of which didn't necessarily welcome entrepreneurial initiative, government involvement to bring infrastructure, mm -hmm. including broadband infrastructure. And so this point about distrust, oh, yes, it's, yes. it's a big point. And one of the issues, and I think this comes up from what Andrew and John said too, is part of it is trust us, you're gonna need this. We're not sure we can tell you now exactly how much. Um, yeah. That is, you know, for this, foreign technology that we'll bring in the outside world, you know, that um, one of the hard parts about broadband economic development tools is that a lot of communities, they may not get why this is something they should value. When you, when you look at the, and a lot of the discussion so far today has been on the life-changing nature of broadband access and the expansion of, of horizons, that sort of thing, and that there is, I think, in every rural tribal community, a tension. That's very natural now. So you really, if you're going to bring something in there, yeah, the worst thing you can do, as you just said, is say, boy, do we have an idea and a technology for you, and you're going to do this. And that's, um, you'll find, you'll create resistance. If you let the, the entity, the tribal entity, say, really make its own decision, make its own case, which often involves a lot of deliberation, a lot of discussion, but typically ends up in a kind of consensus, um, um, you know, then you will have a chance to do it. And one of the, I think one of the, as I began to look at the problem that was posed for this panel, I was really intrigued by, if you take the most, uh, the paradigm of the most remote areas in the United States, mm -hmm. say that five, the lost 5%, that is um, almost- or 6% it sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> 6%. Um, that is the most intractable. These are folks that face all that litany of terrain, distance, sparseness, et cetera, um, you add to that, from a tribal standpoint, a different perspective and a, maybe a, its own regulatory perspective on how it might or might not embrace a technology. Um, uh, to me, the intriguing part of this discussion is way to take that paradigm and, and maybe I'll come back to this possible solutions, but how do you approach bringing that lost 6% back in to have the opportunity, um, you know, culturally, you want to bring it along at the right pace, but really to provide that opportunity, how do you keep that from being a part of our nation that sees that horizon continually move away from it? So let me um, go on a, this thread a little bit more, yeah. and we have Dave Drucker here who helped found Wild Blue, which is the mm -hmm. satellite access. Yeah. In remote areas, satellite TV mm -hmm. played a key role because cable infrastructure was not economical. Yes. So what lessons do we have to learn from satellite TV bringing multi-channel video to more remote areas to the question about broadband to remote, or yeah. remote areas? And that's where I came without talking with David, who I haven't talked to in a long time, but it was great to see you here. Um, um, as I began to look at this, and we had looked at this a number of years ago, about this remote, most remote left behind population. You take this 6% and you say, okay, We've got all the problems, the litany. What can we do to work with? And some of the factors that are pluses, there tend to be some clusters, mm -hmm. uh, Upper Rockies, Southwest, Northwest, Alaska, in some paradigms. And we began to look at the fact that, okay, you're not gonna trend, you're not gonna be able to very efficiently string wires, and basically went, what is the core of the problem? And this is all, Oh, with the with the caveat of that you create a consortium that of tribes and that sort of thing that is able to work with this on a local level, and it seemed to me that the the solution really was as it was in TV. You're not going to be able to string trench, land cable on the shore, anything to bring these communities in, but to create that option and it's the most flexible. I would pose to be provocative that it really is a satellite solution for that last six percent. And it takes, you know, as we began to look at, the ingredients are out there in the market. And when we talk, getting back to what is, what's broadband? Yeah. How should you define it? Well, it may, um, um, David may disagree with me because I don't know what you can achieve right now, but it may not be, to me, it may not be Netflix ready, but it may be the broadband of a few years ago. But to bring that in and make it an option for a community 
within, within its own decision making. And basically, you, what I call, you created the, uh, the solution to the backhaul choke point. How do you get a pipe? And you're not, you know, how do you do it with low impact on terrain, low terrestrial impact? So it's an option for the community, and there are now technologies that I think to do that that become, with relatively modest uh, subsidies, feasible to offer that to a community. And then it can make its own decision. Do we want a LTE, you know, system in a number of hamlets? Do we want, uh, do we want it in anchor institutions where we have very robust for telemedicine and school? That's up to them. Um, so I think there is a solution that's out there that is compatible with local sovereign decision making. So you teed this nice up for John. You, you gave us the 6%. What's your working hypothesis of the best strategy to get broadband to that 6%? How much is satellite? How much are community-based creative solutions? How much can you guys do with some subsidy? Do you guys have sort of a recommended strategy for that? Well, uh, if you don't mind, I'll go back to, to the most recent uh, universal service reform order, the Connect America Fund. The FCC, in discussions with us and other providers, I think realized over time that we, we can't reach everybody. I mean, we just know where we can. So they've created a, a subset fund for areas like that, which is mostly for satellite. And I think it's 10 or 15 percent. I forget the exact numbers. So I think in the reform of the Connect America Fund, the FCC actually realized that, that some of that money had to go to, to the Viasats and the Wild Blues of the world for, for serving those areas. And so that, that to me, is pretty much validation of what you're saying, that that might be the solution. Uh, that, that leaves us as a wireline provider with, with other solutions possibly. We, we've been exploring uh, more robust community partnership uh, solutions rather than just saying no, no, uh, which is, uh, has been com very comfortable for a lot of providers. Historically, we're saying, what do you, before you go out and, and do a $1 deal with Google, wh what do you really need? And so once we, we start the dialogue piece, that becomes more and more important. We find out, you know, almost every city wants a gig, but it's kind of to the point, one of you was saying, they don't really know what to do with it. They just know they need it or want it. And so we find in some certain instances, these discussions with cities or, or small munis have paid off in that once they realize what, what's out there or what we can do, and there's one city I won't mention by name, but they were uh, had a city referendum that the city would go into the fiber business. And we knew, and the two other fiber providers in the city, there were three fiber networks in the city, until we showed them a map where all of our fiber intersected and went all through, they, they didn't know they had fiber, which is maybe shame on the providers. But they, they backed off and said, well, maybe we don't need to do this. But in other words, the dialogue to me is getting increasingly important. And then the, the kind of the, what we can do without a partnership, it, it's really, like I said, we, we've had a very aggressive rural broadband program as, with our company, and so there's not a lot left but we are optimistic that with the CAF funding we took, and, and some of you may know that uh, CenturyLink was the largest recipient of the recent CAF dollars, we will receive and, and match to some extent $3 billion over the next six years to reach 1.2 million households. And I may be getting ahead of you on the agenda there, but, but that is uh, uh, the, the FCC gentleman earlier, I think John mentioned that you know universal service is great, but it's not the alpha and omega. Even with that much money and that much time, we're still not going to be able to reach all of the households in our area without that don't have broadband today. So, Andrew, you teed up four different types of creative solutions. It's worth noting that, um, and, and I believe Viasat slash Wild Blue has found this, that some of the remote customers are not in areas you would have expected. Hmm. So, in other words, what we call exurbs include communities that have a hard time getting know, the high quality access to broadband that some people might want or expect. And so the customer base of who gets left underserved isn't um, as black and white as some people might think. So that creates, you know, lots of interesting challenges about partnerships. Um, Andrew, you started to talk about that before. What, what do you see, and, and I like Steve's tee, teeing up bottom-up co collaborative solutions. What are some of the strategies you see going on now that could be um, fruitful? Um, great question. Um, first, let me just describe where we see our inequities, our ability to reach all of our students. Um, and I'm going to build off of some of the points that uh, Sharon Gooman made earlier that um, we are going to digital content. And with digital content, there's homework. And with that homework, you've got to be able to get on the internet to be able to compete with your peers in class. So that's kind of the foundation of this. So our challenges are in low income areas. 
And hats off to Comcast and CenturyLink for their 995 um, programs. They do work. They don't work um, fully. And we're working on that. There's a, a bunch of old tapes. And I don't know if CenturyLink has done this, but uh, Comcast used to have rules in place that said, if you owed us money, then you can't get onto our internet essentials. So think about your lowest um, income households. They had a barrier right there. Um, there were also barriers with, um, with families that may have not been documented. And when you had to get online to provide information, that was a barrier. Now you can call them up and you can get past those barriers. I'm guessing CenturyLink is doing similar things. So those programs are getting better. That's great. But we do have um, mountain communities where CenturyLink does not have um, fiber or access um, up there. And so we have those students that um, struggle to stay connected. And they've either got to come down the mountain or they've got to suffer through whatever um, um, access they have. So what are some of the solutions? Um, I'll give a very specific example. Boulder Valley School Districts has um, our own fiber network. We have about 100 miles of private fiber serving all but two of our schools. So Jamestown and Gold Hill are the two schools that we don't have fiber to. CenturyLink provides 10 megabit uh, metro ethernet up to those two schools, but we're capped at 10 there. Um, we've got fiber running up the canyon, and I would love to enter into a public-private partnership with at least one of the mountain communities. But I can't do that because of something called Senate Bill 152 which says that I cannot get into the space of providing uh, telecommunication services. Um, there's a way to get out from underneath that, and the Boulder Valley voters will be um, um, taking that on this November to see if we can get out from under it, and then we will look to those um, private partner, private public partnerships. That's just a small example. We believe those private uh, public partnerships can be used elsewhere in the state, especially in the rural areas where maybe governments already have fiber access in the ground, maybe it's limited, maybe they can partner with the CenturyLinks, they can partner with the Zayos or, um, or, or Comcasts out there. I think it's a whole new area, though, that we really, as a government entity, need to be opened up and freed from uh, in order to, uh, to work with the private entities to do so. So, Patty, I'd love to get some historical perspective on different forms of collaboration, private-public partnerships that have solved infrastructure challenges. Uh, electrification in the West is a really interesting case study. Um, and one tool that was used there was developing co cooperatives. Um, there are lots of different types of models. W what are your thoughts on, on, on these um, infrastructure solutions that have been tried in different contexts? I, I should be able to do something with water. Yes. Okay. Let's see. <laughs> uh, in my field of Western American history, for a long time, the standard story was that We'll just go with water. That that was, uh, there's a book called Rivers of Empire. There's uh, Mark Reisner's famous Cadillac Desert about all the centralized power. And so that was a very standard thing about the development of water in the West being very top down. Bureau of Reclamation, Corps of Engineers governing everything. The problem with that, it was, well, it was a very clear and very satisfying narrative. I'm not sure it was satisfying. It was probably terrifying in some ways. But uh, but it turns out, fortunately, not to be true. It's really so decentralized. And it, working on the history of Denver water was how I en ended up thinking, I don't really get where, where Mark Reisner gets this centralized power. I don't see that. And instead, it's really, if, if it's rivers of empire, it's rivers of, of tiny little competing city-states or little uh, turf wars. So the interesting, I think water is probably quite handy for that because to the degree that Reclamation and the Corps of Engineers try to uh, have federal authority and shaping of the system, they did to a significant degree. I'm not denying their powers, but it certainly was not the full coordination and centralization. These uh, competing uh, utilities, urban, rural, dis conservation districts, conservancy districts, rather, all those things are out there. And at a certain point, they're so damn fragmented that they have to deal with each other. And they may have come to be very bitter about each other's existence. And the last thing in the world they want to do is deal with each other. And they have to do that. The, the state now, the state, uh, the agreement that Denver Water came to with the Western Slope, that was six years of getting together and getting to know each other and uh, not enjoying that. And then finally feeling good enough to go out to dinner. And that seems like that was a really big thing. That the, It's odd that this is a lot about face-to-face. -face. Some of the things you're, you're saying, they could have Skyped, but I don't know. So, uh, so you may have heard that phrase. It's, it's quoted everywhere at water conferences that Mark Twain said, uh, whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting. 
and that's used at every damn water conference. And it's the problem is that Mark Twain doesn't seem to have said it. So <laughs> uh, the Mark Twain papers, people say, we see no evidence. We can't prove that he didn't say it. But he's a lot wittier than that. We'll say that for Mark Twain. But I have rewritten that for a more realistic version, whoever said it. So it's whiskey is for drinking. We stick with that part. But water is for brewing coffee to be served at stakeholder meetings. <laughs> and so I think the water thing shows this great fragmentation of jurisdictions. And then uh, maybe contemporary drought being the biggest force for saying, that's not going to work if we all just divide up and pursue our separate interests. And sorry to say this in a courtroom, but uh, it's not going to work if we're doing it all through litigation. So there's such a drive to cooperation that comes out of that. And I guess I will say, uh, as an historian, it's amazing how, I guess, improbably long it takes to arrive at that. So for me, one of the great mysteries of water history in the United States is that on the East Coast, when the British uh, colonies or uh, were still in the settler phase, nearly every urban concentration, uh, New York, Boston, they put their water supply facilities right next to their sewage. And so you think, well, now that's an odd thing to do. And then that's how more coordinated water systems emerges because that's not a good plan, long, unless you're really on the side of typhoid and you want maybe it's a growth control device or something. So, uh, <laughs> so what's really weird is that that uh, behavior of not sufficiently separating human waste from water supply, people who were from the eastern United States moved to the west and do the same damn thing. And it's just, uh, it's weird that something so obvious as in coordinate this, that it has to be learned and relearned. But I do think that's, uh, I was interviewed by the Atlantic Monthly online about the California drought. And you can see me just struggling to say that the first question the reporter asked me is, how bad is the California drought? And then I think, I don't want to use the word bad. So the transcript is just hilarious. You see me just going, well, I wouldn't necessarily use the word bad, though I do understand for the farmers who are not able to grow crops, it seems very bad. But, but it's a, it's a wake-up call, and a wake-up call isn't necessarily bad. So I think that's the hard thing, is that the thing that says to you, time to deal with your neighbors and collaborate can sometimes be a very painful message delivery system. And I don't know what... Well, I, I think in broadband, a lot of these efforts do require community collaboration yeah. across different bounds. Um, Steve, that seems to resonate with you, what Patty mm -hmm. was talking about. Do you want to pick that up? Yes, I think the... I'm trying to think of a historical parallel, but what the REA did provide a couple of things was money and a kind of superstructure or standardization that was imposed in terms of, of you know, the standards for what was being built out, which then helped a lot of connectivity between different communities. Um, kind of following up on, on how do you solve this problem of the intractable areas, using that as a way of thinking about some of these. Um, I was intrigued that, that if you took the REA model and placed in it, let's say, a tribal consortium. I'm big on, while, while people say, you know, tribes have a difficult time working together actually, I've actually found that if it's approached right, you can build great consortiums, especially when you're building a common infrastructure that then can be participated in as, as a given area wants to do. Um, I noticed that the, the National Congress of American Indian had a big resolution recently calling for a tribal broadband fund, which would be something analogous to that to create, let's say, a satellite thing that could reach those clusters that are the, the receding lost islands of our, of our country right now and really bring that, uh, you know, bring that an element of a, of a national structure, a national funding consortium of which the tribes, I think, a lot of them have some resources to contribute to that. Not all of them, but, but enough to make it, I think, worthwhile, especially in Alaska. Um, and that that kind of concept, if, if really brought together, I think would be, um, someone, ought, let me put it this way, that someone ought to do that and put that together because that's a plan that will work from a, yeah. from a private sector standpoint as well as tribes as well as, I think, of minimizing and making more efficient 
how the government subsidizes programs so we can finally get these folks into what, it may not be Netflix ready, but it may be pretty close. And if you're sitting in a village in a remote area of Alaska, and you have nothing, and suddenly you're able to do mail, internet, browsing, communication, maybe Skype, that's a world of difference, and it will make a big difference on this community. So John, final word, picking up on this, then we'll go to the audience. You're more familiar than probably anyone on this panel with the actual details of the FCC's strategy, the Connect America Fund, so-called CAF. Um, if you had a chance, open slate, to just craft your own regime with whatever incentives, carrots, sticks, you know, requirements, what would you do? And if you just want to say the FCC got it exactly right, there are <laughs> FCC members here, I'm sure they'll appreciate that, but are there things that you would do differently to try to drive towards the solutions that have been talked about here? That's a dangerous question. Um, well, I, I think the, the FCC got it mostly right with, with the CAF funding, and they've obviously put a lot of work in it. They, they've sought a lot of feedback from providers of all types, wireless us and others. So I think for the most part, they're achieving the goal you know, that they laid out, the short-term goal they laid out. What I think is, is probably missing, in this, and I, I could have a whole litany here on unintended consequences of some of these decisions that are made, for instance, maintaining a network. Uh, long term. A lot of people see build a network, but they don't think what it's going to look like in five years. How do you evolve it? How do you maintain it? That all costs money and has, it needs expertise. But in terms of the cap order, I, I think, you know, you're seeing, you'll see benefits of speeds of 10 down, one up, uh, you know, relatively quickly there. The, the issue there, I think, is, is, is what also you don't see from the cap order is multiple communities are losing voice funding which does not sound too radical in a broadband age, but if you're a 911 uh, PSAP or, or whatever, or, or a first responder, that, that may make uh, some people very nervous, but that's actually what's happening. So there, there's gonna be large, I think we have up to, <coughs> I hope I don't misquote my number, but approximately 200,000 areas that may lose their voice, all of their federal funding, because this is a brand new program. Everything you know about universal service really changed with this program. So there's going to be, that, that to me is an unintended consequence unless the FCC addresses that, and they are looking at it, they realize that. The other thing is the, the, the ability to, to have ubiquitous service reconciled with faster service, and that is a tension that's going on now. We talked about the 25 megs. Well, that, that 25 megs raises the bar, even for a provider like us, way high for us. So, but the only problem with 25 megs, we could build 25 megs instead of 10, but the coverage would be so much less because of the cost. So the, but then you're disenfranchising people who could have at least gotten 10. So the, the, the challenge the policymakers and the providers are gonna have is, okay, what speed do you want? Tell us, but you can't do both in every case. You can't get ubiquitous coverage and maybe 25 megs for everybody. We're gonna struggle with these last markets for us to get 10 out there. It, it's a challenge. These are the, the most remote of the remote in a lot of cases. So again, that's another issue. I don't, I'm not saying they, they missed the, the ball there, but it's something that we're gonna all have to deal with longer term as the need for speed continues to increase. That's very helpful, John. Let's go to the audience first with student questions. Yep, right over here, yep. Hi, my name's Aisha and I'm at 2L here. Uh, recently I was on a JetBlue flight and I was just amazed by how fast the internet was. And we did some reading in class in telecom, we found out they're using satellite. And how GoGo is trying to move towards satellite and how much faster it is. So is there a move like that for the rural communities as well? Because you guys talked about it a little bit, but it was tremendously faster. I just wanna see if there's a move for that for the rural communities to get the faster internet. All right, I think to be fair, um, maybe Al, if you could bring the microphone to David, if you're willing to. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, or actually, better yet, Mike Dornick, because <laughs> recent grad. So Mike works at Echo Star in the satellite business. What's, uh, right behind you, Eddie Al. So Mike, what's the speeds that we're seeing with satellite connectivity? Uh, we had a few people conjecturing, but where's the state of the art right now? That's the best answer. It's, uh, it's like uh, some of the Jupiter 1 and Jupiter 2 satellites we have are like 140 gigabit per second, roughly today. Now, and to be clear, that's divided by a lot of people using it, right? So this is one of the challenges that satellite has, which mm -hmm. any fixed network, but satellite has it on a massive scale. If you have like 20 customers, 140 gigabits, man, you're doing great. If you have 2 million customers, 
that's constraining the network a little bit more. How do you manage the congestion when it's literally all one shared network? Charge more? We, is that what my We have to charge more. I mean, that's the, that's the answer. You that's have to right, charge more. Here. There's no, I mean, it costs money to get them up there, right? So you get the satellites up there. Once they're up there, we have to charge more. That could, with more, we are launching another satellite. And also there's one web, which for reasons that are obvious, some people, we think that's the best business plan right now for a universal satellite internet um, provider. So it is changing a lot as far as to answer your question. With a lot of the satellite internet, we're heavily involved in our technology. The speed is increasing actually much more rapidly than people know about, I think, and, and the gentleman in front might be a, a good person to answer that question as well. But Well, actually, um, a matters of technology, a rabbi is in the house, so let's go to Dale Hatfield. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Dale, for the non-techies in the room, explain what latency means and how does it impact the <laughs> uh, Delay, it takes so so much time for to get up to the satellite, especially geostationary orbit, and get back that it makes it even a little bit of a hmm. challenge for just ordinary voice. But uh, Twitch games that kids play, for example, if you have that kind of delay in there, it essentially makes them useless as far as... Uh, far as I know. That's the reason the pressure to move, move the satellites down lower in orbit, I think. <laughs> Great. Next question from a student. All right, front, front row here. It's starting to work. Hi, I'm Allison. Um, uh, this question is specifically probably for Mr. Hillard, but you mentioned a couple times that you're engaging with trying to get communities to have at least some access, like access to email rather than focusing on access to Netflix. Um, are you finding any resistance from the communities that they're less likely to engage with you and they feel like more frustrated because of that idea? Like they want it all and, and you're kind of underestimating them maybe? <laughs> I'll give you my reaction, which is no, because if, you'd have, if you're starting basically from zero, um, getting to the point where broadband was five years ago is an amazing jump into the future. And um, uh, so I think most communities that are, that are way underserved on that uh, would find that's a great step forward. I, I will say, and you know, I think sometimes in the discussion, perhaps at, at a regulatory level, for example, the aspiration of 25, 25 down, three up, that kind of thing, <coughs> which is great and, and is a wonderful aspiration. You don't want to make the, the perfect the enemy of the good and sort of be able to bring these, this lost 5% or wherever it is back into the fold of having at least good access, understanding latency problems, but a lot of the basic applications that vault people into being able to do things, you know, homework, apply for a job, find out jobs, those kind of things, those fundamental things. Um, yes, Am Amazon. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Go um, you know, that's, I, think it, I think that's would be well received and there would be, um, there wouldn't be a kind of backlash. Well, how come we don't have Netflix? Great. All right. Anyone in the audience who has a question? I'm not afraid to call on people. Oh, Callie, great. You know, Callie, front row. Hi. Um, in looking at the balance that it sounds like it's very difficult to strike between trying to close opportunity gaps in rural and frequently marginalized areas and maintaining sovereignty and a sense of choice, do you know if there's been many programs that mm -hmm. try to promote um, not only digital literacy but also things like um, getting more more voice out into the world through digital mediums or, or trying to maintain and promote uh, maintaining tribal culture through making it more public and making it more permanent in a digital sense? A, a, um, an example, I don't, know if this is, I don't know if this is responsive, but certainly, uh, you know, in my experience, a lot of tribes, native corporations, do aspire to, to promote their culture through digital medium. <laughs> and, you know, everything from, um, um, you know, the national native, Native, you know, radio 
and those kinds of things were experiments along that line. So there's definitely an aspiration, not just to be a, a receiver, but to create outputs. And I think, you know, that's, uh, um, uh, you know, for example, anchor institutions in a community, libraries, the tribal council building or something are places where there's a lot of aspiration to, uh, to promote that on a digital basis. Can I yes, add please. to that, that a very remarkable thing in history, which we now maybe take for granted, that American Indian people took possession of English and the printed word. And English and the printed word was used to their injury for a long spell. And then, and I would say that the novelists and creative writers, Scott Mamadays of the world, are as important, I think I would, almost as important as the John Echo Hawks and the Walter Echo Hawks taking advantage of, taking possession of Indian language uh, and incorporating that into what it might mean in, in law, or Indian concepts and Indian thought. So it seems like a parallel thing is happening here. Of the most excellent phrase used in one collection of essays on this for writing, for the uh, printed word, was the empire writes back, which is very clever as you absorb that. You're still maybe absorbing that, but it's very clever. <laughs> Really, <laughs> really, really clever. It's not my phrase, so I can uh, put it out as clever. But on your point, Kelly, it's really, I, I mean, I'm very lucky that I have escaped the corral of specialization. So I am sometimes at conferences on tribes and, and their energy resources, and then I'm at conferences on tribes and their water resources, and, and then this is my first visit to tribes and their broadband resources. But it seems like it would be quite cool to bring those conversations of assertion of sovereignty and choice and timing and pacing and claiming resources and access. And those conversations right now are very fragmented, and yet I should think they would be informative if convened, uh, leaving tribal people, well, not leaving tribal people aside, but including them in a broader umbrella. I'm on the board of Energy Outreach Colorado, which helps low-income people with their energy uh, costs and prices. And like, there's been like four times where I thought, oh, the board meeting of EOC, we need somebody from, from this conference to come to our board meeting and talk about the similar issues of deprivation and relief of injustice in uh, assuring low-income people warmth in the, in the winter and, and access to, to telling people about their troubles if they need. I mean, it just, it just seems like there's a lot of, to be done here by convening across the categories. And, I'm delighted and honored to be a person who goes to the different things, but I'd be happy to have others joining me. And then I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure how you how you do that, but you so have to hold the conference, Patty. Is that what I said? No. <laughs> Is there funding for it? Sorry. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, Phil, can I yeah, add one thing culturally? So we have another thing going on in our culture right here, right now, and it relies on bandwidth. So. How many of us grew up in the age of email being our main form of, of communication? Some of us more older. I'm over 50, so I fall in that category. Um, but then we went into the social media and the Facebook world. And many of our kids were in the Facebook world, and they still are. But then that has morphed again now into tools like Snapchat. And how many of you know what Snapchat is? Most of you. Real-time communication, short videos, short text that in theory, go away. Nothing goes away, by the way. Um, but when you think about that, it requires bandwidth. So our number one bandwidth usage in Boulder Valley schools is Snapchat, hmm. outside of Google and the, the main education. YouTube. More than YouTube. It surpassed YouTube at the end of last year. And it's because Snapchat enabled videos. I bring this up, though, because our students today are communicating with each other through this new mechanism. And it requires bandwidth to do. And so our culture today is relying on that. When you get to the rural areas, when you get to those places where we don't have it, they're not experiencing this transition to the new way of communicating. Great. All right. Uh, last question. Uh, you want to go to Ken over there? You can reach out, Ken. But just Thanks. So that was a great comment, and it ties into some of the other comments. And, and I just want to throw out a struggle that I'm having internally and get um, any of you who want to have feedback on this, including our moderator. Um, 
so we've heard the we shouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, and I get it how how hard and expensive it is to go from either no or really bad broadband to something that is less than ideal. Um, and we've got the FCC. Uh, well, we've had two panels today now talk about it, the importance of building the network of the future because what we're using today is not going to be sufficient five years from now or ten years from now. We've got the FCC saying 25 down and three up is the latest um, threshold for what they're going to use to determine are Americans getting broadband um, at a reasonably decent pace. And yet we've just approved or they've just approved billions of dollars over the next six years um, for anyone who would commit to build 10 down and one up. Um, so when we get back to the question is, did they get it right? Should there have been more money put into it? Uh, should we be looking for other sources of funding for, from other agencies? I, I, I just have this incredible discomfort with saying this is what we have now. We know we're going to need way more in the future, in the short-term future, and we're going to spend billions of dollars getting to a point in six years where we won't even have what the FCC considers broadband today. So, John, this is a direct follow-up on what you said, and you didn't raise this point, but, but Ken's raising it. Is there not enough money getting thrown at this problem to solve it? I don't know how much money it's actually going to require. I, I think it's a, a moving target, and you, you've asked a question that our CFO asked when we were debating the CAF money is shouldn't we just go ahead and bill for 25 for, to and wait for the evolution to come? And I think in a lot of cases that's probably what we'll do, but we can't do it in every case. But I think we're chasing something we really aren't going to be able to ever fully catch. And I'm not sure that there's enough money out there. Really, that's why these partnerships and all the other things we're talking about, maybe even collaboration among providers, that's another thing we've explored uh, with some of the RLEX in some of our states is where they have connectivity we don't, or we have connect or backhaul they don't, we're, we're, we're actually going to do a trial with, some, with three small providers is can we find a way to, to serve some of these really remote areas by conjoining our networks in a way. And I don't know what that does in the regulatory world for interconnection or anything else, but at the same time, th those are the types of, I think the providers who have the networks have the best opportunity, if, like you said, they will talk and, and start trying to look for those solutions. I don't think the government can solve it all. So, so I think the next wave of discussions are among providers who have uh, networks who are adjacent to each other and can find ways to work, maybe to serve an area that otherwise couldn't be served. But I think that that's not here yet, but I think those are the discussions that we're going to be seeing going forward. So what I'll add to it, and maybe Andrew has some follow-up on this too, on the institutional side, the states need to be positioned to be more of a leader in this area, and they need to more experiment across different states, taking the resources that currently exist to get the most done. Um, and part of that will involve information gathering, relationship building, different terms of partnerships and cooperation. So if the states aren't institutionally empowered to do this, I worry that you've got no one who's situated at the right level to do it. Because just at the local level, you don't have enough visibility as to what the opportunities are or where the collaborations are. And at the federal level, the FCC cannot drive this all from Washington. So that's, I think, a big mistake. May I have one, one thing? Please, yeah. Th this state has a state universal service fund that's transitioning to a broadband fund. Many states do. Uh, th there are going to be funding gaps. And one thing we're working with state governors and others right now in various states is pointing out the fact that CAF money is not a magic wand. It's not solving everything. But the, 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 I think it's the, the 2011 CAF order said there is a role for the states uh, with the federal government to help funding solutions. So. To me, if you're really focused as a state on broadband solutions, those are the, the, the funding mechanisms are going to be critical. Whether It doesn't have to be all for us or all for Comcast or anyone else that's taking the money, but that's where the rest of the money <coughs> come from. And so you may be talking about technology funds, broadband funds, call them what you like, but the funding mechanisms and, and say, a governor's uh, vision for their state, whether it be technology or in your case, I guess bicycle trails, whatever uh, you have, you know, th that type of commitment is really a declaration is what it's going to take, I think, to, fin to answer your question of how do you get there longer term. Yep. Andrew? So uh, for me, this comes back to, as a society, how do we view Internet services? And I think we're in a transitionary phase right now. We view as a society that roads in our community are important. And as such, we raise taxes 
that cover the, the roads for everybody. We don't discriminate or, uh, against what roads people can get on. Schools are the same way. We raise taxes so that we can educate our entire population. Internet is something really relatively new. And it was something that we purchased because we wanted to download something off of a, uh, a bulletin board many years ago. And it's now evolved to we want to download a, a movie. But it's also evolved to be the fabric of how our society is learning. And when I look at it that way, I think there's got to be some, some strong leadership at the national level to ask, does America want to have broadband as something that everybody has access to and we all get to participate into the economy? equally. It's a good note to end on. I want to thank our panel for a great discussion. <laughs>